Keybase is a platform for managing public key infrastructure. Keybase's products simplify the complicated process of associating your identity with a public key. Keybase is the subject of the first half of today's show. Michael Maxim, an engineer from Keybase, gives an overview for how the technology works and what kinds of applications Keybase unlocks. The second half of today's show is about Clarify. Clarify is an AI platform that provides image recognition APIs as a service. Habib Talavati explains how Clarify's infrastructure processes requests and the opportunities for improving the efficiency of that infrastructure. Last month, we had three Software Engineering Daily meetups in New York, Boston, and Los Angeles. At each of these meetups, listeners from the SE Daily community got to meet each other and talk about software, what they're building, and what they're excited about. I was happy to be in attendance at each of these, and I'm posting the talks given by our presenters. The audio quality is not perfect on these, but it's not terrible, and there's also no ads. Thank you to Datadog for being a gracious sponsor for providing this space for our meetup and also for sponsoring the podcast. You can sign up for Datadog and get a free t-shirt by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. And we'd love to have you as part of our community. We will have more meetups eventually, and you can be notified of these meetups by signing up for our newsletter. You can also come to softwaredaily.com and get involved with the discussion of episodes and software projects. And you can check out our open source projects, the mobile apps, and our website. You can find all of that at softwaredaily.com. And with that, let's get to these weekend episodes about our meetup presenters. Thanks for coming to the meetup. I'm really excited to have Mike Maxim and Habib Halavati to speak from Keybase and Clarify, respectively. And before we get started, we're going to hear from Datadog, who's the sponsor, the host, who has generously provided the food and beverage for everybody. So yeah, Elon, take it away. So thanks, everybody, for joining us here at, at Datadog today. Just a quick show of hands. How many folks are using Datadog at work right now? If you work at Datadog, you don't count because, <laughs> I mean, you do count. But yeah, so uh, Datadog offers a, is a monitoring platform for all your infrastructure and applications, everything from logs to, metri logs to metrics to tracing. So we'd love to help you monitor your infrastructure. We'd also love to have you join our team. We're here in New York, as well as in Boston and Paris, and are pretty remote friendly. And we're hiring for everything from SREs to software devs to everything and to everything else you may be able to imagine. Our website is full of jobs. If you're, if you're, if you're here during the breaks and you want to learn a little bit more about opportunities here at Datadog, love to love to chat with you. Jeremy, Dan, raise your hands. Other Datadog people, raise your hands. You can find any one of us and chat with us about opportunities here. Everything from, again, from like hacking on backend analytic systems and with Redshift and Looker and Spark and Kafka and everything else in between to like SRE and stability and everything and other topics as well. The other thing I wanted to mention is if you look on your seats, most of you seem to have sat on them. They're little scratch off cards. They are actually worth something. So you might want to grab one. We're Datadog's running our user conference at the end of the, over the summer, July 11th and 12th. It's an event called Dash. And each of you have a, have a little scratcher ticket on your seats with an opportunity to win a free pass or discounted passes to, to Dash. So it'll be a great opportunity to get hands-on workshops on everything from containerization and, and, and observability to, how, to seminars from, from your peers on how they're, how they're scaling their systems and, and their infrastructure, a lot, like some, a lot like some of the topics we're going to hear about today. So without further ado, I'll hand, I don't know if I'm handing off to Jeff or I'm yeah. handing off to Mike, but back to you all. Thanks. Thank you, Alon. I think there are some people here who, who don't really know what Software Engineering Daily is, which is totally fine. And just to fill you in, if you haven't heard of Software Engineering Daily, it's a podcast about software engineering. It's five days a week. And the format is fairly technical software engineering content. If you are a listener to the show, then hopefully I've had a chance to say hi and shake your hand and meet you. And if not, I'd love to meet up at talk a little bit. We're going to have 30 minutes kind of after the presentations, hopefully to chat for a little bit. And as always, you can send me an email or Slack message or whatever, but yeah, we'll, we'll get the ball rolling. The schedule is on the meetup page. If you don't know what the schedule is. So we'll start with Mike Maxim, who is uh, just to give him a quick introduction. He's been the CTO and the CEO of OKCupid before he 
joined Keybase, which was started by the, the founders of OkCupid. And Keybase is a pretty incredible company. So I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about Keybase in the future. So I would pay attention closely. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks for Datadog for uh, having us uh, having Keybase here to give you guys some more information about it. Before I get started, just a quick show of hands. How many people have heard of Keybase or have used Keybase? All right, some people. How many people know what public key cryptography is? More people. All right, great, good. So we won't be starting from scratch here. So Keybase, crypto for everyone. You know, Keybase was started in uh, 2015, and the, the stated mission is to bring you know public key crypto tools to everyone. You know, the space has traditionally been very complicated, very hard to use, and has never really caught on other than like SSL or TLS with like larger groups of people. The tools have been traditionally hard to use and hard to really coordinate and get people into. So the goal of Keybase is, is to change all that, provide an infrastructure to make public key crypto accessible to people, and to provide apps on top of that uh, that sort of allow you to integrate crypto into your day-to-day -day workflow, like on your computer, either through, you know, chat, file system or, or with Git for programmers, that kind of thing. So this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about crypto. I know people, people have indicated they know what it is, but we'll just do a quick refresher. We'll talk about how Keybase sort of fits into that scene, we'll talk about how Keybase can run on devices, and then these apps that I was just mentioning that sort of take advantage of all of this uh, infrastructure that Keybase provides. And these, these slides are public at that address. Cool. So, so why is crypto important? So this little slide here will show sort of like all the services people use. People use a lot of these cloud services these days, anything from Dropbox, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Slack, Google Drive, all kind of stuff. You're communicating through the cloud and you store your files there. You know, traditionally, like all of this stuff is out in the open. Once it hits people's servers, um, you know, Slack almost certainly can read all of your email or all of your, your stuff. Dropbox can as well. You know, it's fine for a lot of people, but it'd be nice if there was a way to sort of have these kind of cloud services, but not have to make that, that sacrifice in, in personal privacy or to be attacked. And so the traditional crypto setup, the, the, you know, these little crypto exercises, we have the actors as being Alice and Bob. These are two very famous Alice and Bob people. And then Mallory is traditionally the, your, your adversary in these things. And so, so the goal of crypto is to be able to do all these fun things that you can do without having to give up your privacy or be attacked by a third party. So what does Keybase do? So Keybase is a, uh, it's a set of tools, like I said, that sort of solves this Mallory problem here. So you know, we, our goal is to create a set of usable tools that allow you to do all these things that you're used to doing, chat, share files, collaborate, and, uh, and host your content in a secure way. And so here on the bottom is, well, I don't know if you can really see this that well, but these are the sort of the four main things that we have uh, in the Keybase app. So the key aspects of, of true encrypted communication is you want to be able to, Alice wants to be able to communicate with Bob under the following circumstance. So, you know, you have an adversary called Mallory listening in. Mallory can possibly tamper with whatever's there. Mallory can uh, impersonate other people in this chat, it controls the servers. So, you know, all this sort of stuff is possible. Alice wants to be able to communicate with people under these circumstances here. So how do we, how do we make that happen? The traditional approach here is through public key cryptography. Just a brief refresher on how this is. Just, uh, just uh, for people to know more about, this is the Diffie-Hellman formulation of uh, public key crypto. The idea here is that you want to, uh, you know, both Alice and Bob publish in some way public key associated with both of them. And that public key comes along with a private key that is known only to Alice and Bob. This is called a key pair. So both Alice and Bob have a public private key key pair. They publish the, uh, the public key somewhere. When they want to talk, they get together and they can do some fancy calculation with both of these public keys and come up with a shared secret that they can then use to communicate with using a normal crypto algorithm. You know, for, for a lot of these formulations, you can use uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, if people know what that is. That's what Keybase uses. But there's others like RSA that you may have heard of. Furthermore, if you really want to get fancy, you can actually not have one public key for yourself, but many. Is the shared secret really from the public keys? It's public keys. Uh... The public keys are used to compute a shared secret. It's a combination of the public and private keys of both parties. So Alice and Bob can do some calculation in the, in the elliptic curve calculation, you, ha, you know a point on a curve, and then you can multiply it by the public part of the curve, and then both of them can do that. It reveals no information to the other party, because in order to do that, they have to solve some very hard problem, in this case, the discrete log problem, to back out the private key. 
So like once you get that calculation, the shared secret could just be like HMAC of whatever you compute from your private key and the public key part of your of your. Okay, so it's your, not just the public key. No, it's it's a combination of your private and, and public keys. That's correct. And we'll we'll do some time for questions at the end. No, no problem. Moving forward. So here's just a little diagram of how this would work. This guy over here says, Dear Alice, I want to talk to you. They do this key exchange here using their public and private keys to come up with a shared secret. Once the shared secret is established, then that takes over. Now, the reason you do this is because like these, these symmetric key algorithms typically are much faster. It's much easier to communicate with, uh, with somebody that way than to have to do like some RSA type thing over and over again. Okay, so that's sort of the basics there. So this has been around for a long time. This isn't anything that Keybase has done that's new. There's a lot of public key crypto software out there, things like PGP or GPG tools. There's been plugins for your mail program. One feature of a lot of these things is that they're very difficult to use. I don't know if people may have received an email in the past that had like some sort of PGP header on it that you're supposed to like run through your GPG tools and verify the signature of the person that sent it to you. I don't know. I mean, it, this kind of thing is probably completely out of use. I don't remember the last time I even received one of these things in email. <laughs> And a big part of that is because it's very difficult to use. I mean, nobody really knows what it is. It's, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you'd have to integrate it with your mail program in some way. It always breaks. It's hard to find people's public keys. This has gotten a little bit better recently. There's a lot more, like, especially for chat, there's tools like Signal, WhatsApp, and, and others that make this a little bit easier. But they still, they're still not great on the, on the dissemination of what your public key is. That takes us to sort of my, the next point here, which is there's a big, you know, getting the public key, we'll refer to it as the sort of the identity problem here. You know, how does Bob get Alice's public key? You know, where, where do you go? For the web, something like TLS, there's these, you know, certificate authorities that sign people's certificates and say, this is legit. You know, but if you're just out in the world, what do you do? You know, well, there's these things called key servers for PGP. Here's an example. If you search for Gavin Andreessen, for people who don't know, he was, used to be a um, Bitcoin core developer. You go into MIT's PGP server, which is one of the canonical ones, and you search for Gavin Andreessen, and you get like this list of keys. Some of them are labeled revoked. You know, nobody knows what this is. It's very difficult to actually use this to send Gavin a message you can be, you can be happy that is actually encrypted just for him. And so there's other flawed solutions to distribute the keys. You can put it on a key server. You can post it on your website. Problem with that is how do they know it's actually your website? You can put it on all your emails. That's a little bit hard. It doesn't scale to all your friends. You can put it on Twitter. Problem there is that now you have to trust Twitter. Twitter can lie about what the actual key is. Or you could do something called web of trust. You know, PGP has this notion you can go to like a key signing party. I don't know if anybody's ever been to one of these things, but the idea is, is that you show up with like a laptop in your, in your public private key pair and you just sign each other's keys. And the point of that is so that like, you know, if somebody finds your PGP key out in the wild, they'd be like, oh, you know, like Mike's private key, you know, this, this key was signed by all of Mike's friends. So it's got to be Mike. So, so the problem with that is nobody goes to these parties. So, so yeah, Facebook also has kind of a cool feature where you can go and post your, uh, your PGP key to Facebook and people can find it that way. Another problem with this is that Facebook can, of course, lie to you. Facebook's a pretty trusted entity. You're probably not going to lie. But if, you're really, if you really want to do this right, you have to, well, of course, maybe not these days, but I don't know. Uh, but, but again, any centralized server that's just giving you a PGP key should be viewed with suspicion. Now, how does Keybase solve this problem? The Keybase solution is basically to take the sum total of all of your social networking identities and sum them up as, as you. So your, you know, your Twitter account, your GitHub account, your whatever, your Facebook account, all of these accounts online are, are your, for Keybase are basically your identity. And not only are these services bringing to your, your identity together, this is how we're actually going to distribute your key at all. We're going to do it in a way that any pro, that the Keybase client can go and look at these services, go look at how you proved uh, that you own these social media accounts and automatically verify it so that if anybody tries to change it or if those servers take it down, that will, you can know and so forth. The Keybase service is a centralized server, but the, the trust for the validity of, of the identities in the system is decentralized out to the clients. In other words, all the information coming from the server should just be viewed as, as a hint. Whereas the Keybase clients are going to then, once they receive that hint, will actually go out and verify all parts of your identity. So what does a Keybase proof actually look like? As soon as my slide gets up, I will show it to you. So basically what it's going to come down to is your Keybase client is going to say, I want to prove Twitter. And what you're going to do is you're going to tell the Keybase client what your account name is, 
And the Keybase client is going to give you a bunch of text that says, post this in and put a tweet up on Twitter, and I'm going to go look for it. And this tweet you know, has the form, I am blah, blah, blah on Keybase, and here's a little string here of stuff that verifies that it's me. That string of stuff is a digital signature, a signature that can only be created by the owner of the public-private private key pair associated with my Keybase account. So that's Will Wheaton proving his Twitter account. We can do more than Twitter. We can do uh, a variety of other sites. But first, you, know, you can look at what this actually looks like for a user. I guess this is kind of un unseeable here, but this is a, a SigChain link for this user. Basically, every user on Keybase is represented by a block of, of, uh, of these proofs, and each one sort of verifies the other. So this one is his for Twitter. I'll talk about that in more detail on, on, a, on a future slide. But here's a proof on GitHub. You know, here's a user also claiming a, a, a GitHub account. And then you can also claim websites. You can claim DNS. You can claim Facebook, all kind of stuff. And the purpose of this is as you post these proofs, all these proofs are then checkable by people's Keybase software to verify that you are who you say you are online. So here comes a little slide that shows sort of how Alice and Bob will, will communicate this. So here's Alice talking to Bob saying, you know, Bob, I want to send you some super secret conditioning formula for Bob. And Bob is able to verify that it's the true Alice by, you know, on her client will say like, all right, Alice has proved her Twitter account and her GitHub account. You know, I know Alice by those two identities. I'm going to go out to these services. I'm going to verify it's Alice. As soon as I do, I'm going to accept this as like a, uh, as a legit communication from her. So in addition to these social proofs and the association with your either PGP keys or, or these other device keys, which I'm going to get to in a second, you can also do something like PGP's web of trust here on Keybase. So you can follow other users as well. And it gives you the sort of the same benefits that that you, do, that you get in, uh, in the PGP world, except it's a little bit better. Because when you follow somebody, you have to verify their proofs. So you vouch that this person, so if I, you know, if I follow somebody and I see that they have GitHub proof X and Twitter proof Y, if I then follow them, I've sort of vouched for the validity of those proofs myself as well. And you know, a follow is more than just you know, an entry in the database. I go in and I actually sign a statement with one of my keys and I say, you know, I'm, I'm coming in here, this, I'm gonna say, this person is who they say they are, and here's a signed statement from me uh, to that effect. And I can, I can broadcast this out to the world. So these are the, sort of the two things we have here. We have the social proofs and these web of trust through the follow system on the site that sort of lend power to the identity that you have on Keybase that allows you to get to these public keys that people have published. Okay, so I've been mentioning the Keybase client a lot. You know, the Keybase client is a standalone application that you download and run on your computer. You know, it doesn't run in a web browser. You know, the risk there with a, anything running in the web browser is that it could possibly be, could be changed. You never know what you're going to download from JavaScript. The JavaScript could change on the server. Whereas if you just download this client, you know, it only updates when you want it to. It's all open source, so you can go and verify everything in there yourself if you want, or you can rely on a trusted party to, to know that this is, is legit software. And like I mentioned, it doesn't update underneath you if you don't want it to. And so, so that's great. It also allows it so that we can store your, your public-private key pair associated with this application on your device. So that takes me to the next slide here. You know, in the beginning, Keybase was very much like a PGP, almost like a PGP key server. You know, the idea was is you would, you would upload your, your PGP public key to Keybase, prove a bunch of identities, and then it would be very easy for you to then find people's PGP keys and potentially send them, you know, some, you know, either an encrypted email or some other out-of-band thing. But what we realized is, is that you know, people, people use many devices these days. You, know, you have a phone, you got a computer, you got a laptop. You know, there's, just, there's a lot of different places where you're going to need keys. And PGP keys are notoriously difficult to move around. I mean, the PGP story really is that you should have one master key, which you stick in like a, an explosion-proof safe or something like that, and you never touch it. And then you delegate a bunch of sub-keys to actually, do, to actually you know, be the ones you use out in the world. With Keybase, what we decided to do was instead of, instead of having to worry about all that, we felt it was too difficult for users to, to work with, is to instead have keys associated with a single device. And so when you install the Keybase software, you automatically get a, a NACL, N-A-C-L, public-private key pair installed on your device. And that, that public-private key pair is signed into your account. So now, in addition to having a PGP public-private key associated with a Keybase account, you can also have these NACL keys, which are you know, these ECDH keys, also associated with your, with your online identity. 
That means when you're running your Keybase software, if you, tie, if you go in, you can sign things, you can encrypt things, and they're all signed and encrypted using the key that was generated from the software that was installed on your machine. And so this is pretty great, because this means this private key never leaves the device. You don't have to worry about, as a user, transferring anything from computer to computer. As long as you have provisioned the device using some existing key beforehand, that device is ready to go and can access all of the stuff that you care about in your Keybase world. All of these public keys that are associated with your devices are all shared publicly. Anybody can encrypt a message to you with any of them, which is, which is very convenient. It makes things like our chat program or our file system application work very well. It allows you to like provision a new phone, for instance, and immediately see all your chats. That's not necessarily true in a lot of uh, crypto applications. Just because of how this system works, uh, with how these devices will, will sign themselves into, into your identity. They can also be revoked if you lose it. So I keep using this term SIGChain a lot. Let me, just, let me just flesh it out a little bit here just so we can be sure we know what we're talking about. A SIGChain is basically like a blockchain of your identity. So you can have blockchain, the way it works is it basically says like, here's a bunch of data in a row. And I want to make sure that you are, are absolutely certain that this, this ordering is correct. Nobody, nobody subtracted any blocks out of here. Nobody inserted any that they should. The way they do this is they're able to sign parts of the previous blocks and say, like, this one is legit because I can see all the previous ones before it, and they all have the proper signatures going back in time. That's basically how these sig chains work as well. Every time you change your identity on Keybase, it is signed into, this, into the chain, which represents your identity. So if you prove Twitter, for instance, that's going to be a link in your, in your SIG chain. If you then add a device, if you add like a phone, that's the next link. And that link will refer to the other one so that a client can verify that they're all lined up properly. When the Keybase client loads a user, it will load this entire SIG chain and play it back to make sure that the server gave it accurate information. Now this is what, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where the server is really just giving hints as to what's happening, and the clients are actually going out and verifying that the identities are getting are correct using these remote proofs, as well as, as, the, as the, the validity of the SIG chain itself. So I have a, another example here from my brother Jeff, his, his own SIG chain. I use this because it's a pretty, particularly good one. It's an interesting one to look at. So you can't really see the text here, but the legend is, is, is viewable. Basically, any of these one, a pink box is a device, Green was a PGP key, uh, orange is a paper key, and gray is if you revoked. And so what this shows here is that you know, each, each link in this graph is showing either uh, a proof you know, from, from the thing above it. So like you know, the, this pink box here is a device. It's signed in uh, his GitHub proof and his uh, Twitter proof. And then it also provisioned a PGP key, which then provisioned another device, which then provisioned another device below that. So when the Keybase client is checking the validity of like, the PGP key of all the way at the bottom, it's actually running through his SIG chain, making sure every link that signs in all of these various things is legit. They exist on the social networks all the way down to the bottom. And then it can know that whatever message came from this PGP key definitely came from, from Jeff Maxim here. Another feature of, the, uh, of Keybase is the generation of something called a per-user key. This is important for when we're dealing with chat and, and the file system. Every user on Keybase gets a so-called per-user key that's device-independent. This is a NACL key. This is not a PGP key. This is you know, the, the more modern system. And this thing is also written into your SIG chain. It's, it's useful if you want to be able to, to encrypt something for all of the user's devices. So if you, want to like send, if you want to send me a secret that I can read from any of my devices, you could use one of these per-user keys that's generated on my device. So anytime I provision a new device, it immediately gets this per-user key because the provisioner can basically give it to me. Per-user keys are most useful for teams, which I'll get to in a second. The last thing I'll mention about the SIG chains is, is you know, I keep talking about how the server for Keybase is sort of an untrusted entity. The last piece of the puzzle is sort of making all that work out is to take, these, take this SIG chain data and publish it in a way that even users, not users of Keybase, can go out and verify that things, that the server has not done anything weird, like try to roll back or try to remove people's signatures or, or add new signatures or anything like that without, without a user actually doing it. And the way we do that is, is you can summarize all of the user SIG chains on, on Keybase by simply hashing every single possible link that you have. The problem with that is, is it takes forever. Like you'd have to go through like millions of links and hash them all together. So there's a data structure called a Merkle tree, which is also used in Bitcoin, if you're, if you're familiar with that, where you can sort of summarize very quickly a hash, a single number of the entire system fairly quickly. 
And what we do is we take that number and we actually will do a special Bitcoin transaction with that, what we call the Merkle root, and effectively publish it into the Bitcoin blockchain. So anybody that has the, you know, anybody that has a full node running the Bitcoin blockchain, there'll be transactions in there that represent any change to all the signatures on Keybase, which is kind of neat. Another um, kind of fun part of Keybase, and this is one of the things that really separate, separates it from a lot of apps like Signal and things like that, is the ability to form teams. These teams are more than just like an entry in a SQL database or something like that says these are the people on my team. Teams also have sig chains that represent all the additions and subtractions of people into the team. And they're all verifiable by, by the Keybase clients. So, you know, the purpose is for these teams is to have, you know, either your company use it or you can have like your friends. If you have like some group of friends you want to have uh, talk, you know, on here, you can do that as well. Or your entire company could be on there. All of our applications like chat and the file system work with teams. So like the picture on the right there is a, is a picture of our chat, which, you know, runs on the mobile app as well as a desktop. Supposed to be a little bit like Slack. Supposed to be a little bit of a combination of Slack and an iMessage, I suppose. That's the team situation. The way the teams work is using these per user keys. It's basically, you know, there's, there's one secret for the entire team. That secret is disseminated to people using all the per user keys from the people in the team. You know, the Keybase server can't just uh, add people to the team. A client has to do it and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so you also have sub teams, something like Keybase.board, uh, you know, within a team, which can have members of the team. But cryptographically is separated, has different team secrets than the, than the host team. And this shared team key is automatically uh, rolled basically whenever anybody revokes a device. So if somebody revokes a device, you want to make sure that that person can no longer access any future, co any future communication within that, uh, within that team. And so everybody, you know, everybody rolls up to the new version. It's sent out to everybody again using this per user key. So I started off this talk, talk a little bit about how there's useful apps that are built upon all this infrastructure. So now we have a system that does a pretty good job of identifying people on the internet that you know, giving you access to a variety of different public keys, either their PGP key or these device keys that we generate from the Keybase software. You know, what can we build on that? Well, I touched a little bit on, we have some, uh, the chat application and the file system are, are two of the main ones for us. Key requirement though, is that these things are, are, are real apps. You know, part of the reason PGP failed is it's just it didn't have like a great app, you know, experience that people could get in, really get involved with and use. Our apps try to be just as good as their unencrypted uh, counterparts. Like chat should be just as good as Slack or at least close to it so that the people that are using it don't forget about the fact that they're actually using a secure app and only focus on the fact that they're just using the bad version of Slack. So that's a big deal for us. So Keybase Chat is really one of our, probably one of our, our best deployments of an application built on top of the Keybase infrastructure totally unencrypted. You can identify people simply by their social media and it has, it's all fully integrated with Teams. It runs on every single platform of note, you know, uh, all the desktop platforms, Linux, Mac, and Windows, plus Android and, and iOS as well. And unlike Signal or a lot of these other apps, there's no need to like get in uh, some sort of out-of-band secret transfer. You have to like take a picture of a QR code or get together and exchange, you know, a number or something that pops up on your screen. Everything is handled through, through the Keybase ID system, like the, the, uh, the, you know, the identity system we just talked about. So here's just another shot of the chat screen here. All these messages are signed and, and everything else. One kind of cool feature of, uh, of Keybase chat and Teams in particular is you can have an open team. So these open teams, anybody can join. So like if, you, if you're running like an open source community or something like that, and you want to run it on Keybase chat, you can do so. You can, you can create a team and, and set it to be like anybody that wants to get in this team gets in this team, and then you're in. You may ask what's the purpose of that with an encrypted app. But, you know, at least, you know, when you get people in there, everything is signed so you can know who's talking. So if you're the runner, you know, if you're running this thing and you're speaking in there, everyone can know it's truly you. Furthermore, once you're in there, you can exchange DMs and things like that with people, and that's fully encrypted as well. You know, we have one team on there for a new cryptocurrency called Chia, which is like an environmentally friendly version of Bitcoin. They have a team on here of 1,800 people. So that's uh, been our most successful team yet. You can also join the Keybase Friends team, which has about 1,300 people, and, and talk about Keybase you know, up in there if you want to. The other main application, I'm almost done here, is the file system. This works a lot like uh, Dropbox, uh, the infinite mode of Dropbox. So, you know, the traditional way Dropbox works is you just have like a folder on your computer and the Dropbox thing will go and find what changed and upload it to the server. But all those files exist on your disk. With uh, KBFS, they don't. You're, just, you're effectively just communicating with an API. And furthermore, everything that you're doing is, is in and encrypted as well. 
So, you know, again, this works in pretty much the same way. You know, every, everything in here is encrypted and signed and it works on all the platforms, except for the phones, but the phones are coming soon and you get plenty of free storage. The way KBFS is laid out is you use your Keybase handles to get in there. So like my private folder here, if I'm on a Mac or, Win or on Linux, I can just go to slash Keybase slash private slash Mike M and all my files will be there. Uh, they're all only encrypted for me and all of my devices that are associated with my Keybase account. Not my PGP key, but, but if I have uh, you know, some set of device keys, all of them can get in there and see those files. I can also share files. So I can go into Keybase private and then somebody, comma, Mike M. So if I want to share with Jeff Maxim again, I can stick a file in there. And now everything in there is encrypted for all of my devices as well as for all of his devices immediately. You can also do something kind of cool with Keybase where you can share with a social media handle. So I can share with Mike M, comma, some, some name at Twitter. What that'll do is something kind of cool where it'll create a new folder that'll have files in it. And as soon as somebody proves that Twitter account, they get those files. So we call this like a sharing before sign up thing. So if I know somebody on Twitter, I can go and put a file in this path right here, Mike M, comma, them at Twitter, and then contact them somehow and say, I got some files waiting for you on Keybase. All you got to do is prove that you own this Twitter account, and then they get them. You can do the same thing with chat. It's kind of an interesting feature. And you can do that with all kinds of things. You can do that with a PGP fingerprint. You could do somebody, you know, at PGP fingerprint. You could do something like that with a DNS entry. It's very flexible. And the last thing I'll talk about here is, is the final application of Keybase, which is encrypted Git. We provide a service on top of KBFS that allows you to push a Git repo and set Keybase as a remote. And so you can set like, you know, you can use this fancy URL here, Keybase colon slash slash, and then the location in, Keyb in KBFS where you actually want to push this thing, and it, it will go before, before the files land on Keybase servers, it'll all be encrypted with whatever device is doing the push to that repo and, and, who, and Keybase can't read them. You could do that with teams and personal. So like if you have a team, you can create a team repo. And you know, if you're a DevOps team or something like that, you need to share secrets, you can push them in there. And nobody can see them except for the devices that are signed into whatever team has access to that Git repo. It's kind of cool. It works pretty well in terms of, you know, like with conflict resolution, all that sort of stuff, integrates with popular Git tools and things like that. So it's, it's kind of a neat feature. Like I said, it's, it's very useful if you want to share secrets like on your team, like I said, like AWS access keys. I, I don't, I'm not going to recommend this <laughs> right away for that, but you know, you can think of secrets that you, you can put in there that would, that would be nice. That's encrypted Git. And that's it. That's it for the talk. Um, yeah. Great. So now we got a little time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Start with. Question is, does that Keybase Git thing work on mobile? You can view the repos on mobile, but you can't do anything. Like you can't check them out or you can't push to them or anything like that. But you can, you can just see like the list and like you can see this list basically of which repos you have access to. That's it. How do you make money? Well, <laughs> Thank you. And the short answer is, is we don't currently have a, uh, any sort of revenue in the company right now. I think the goal of, of Keybase has been to get as many people involved with it as we can. You know, I think that the chat application in particular has a nice network effect going on with it. You know, the more people you can get chatting, especially in a lot of these open teams, the more they can get their friends in there. As long as the app works well, we're pretty confident we can get more and more people in there and start using it. Keybase gets more and more popular. That's really what we're, we're hoping will happen. I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about how Keybase could make money. You know, there's been talk about teams of a certain size or corporate teams could, you know, could have to pay similar to how like somebody like uh, GitHub Enterprise works or something like that or Dropbox. And, you know, that's one option. You could charge for KBFS space, that sort of thing. I mean, Keybase has been fortunate that we've had plenty of support from, from people looking to fund the company. I mean, Keybase had a pretty good round when it first got started. And then we recently entered into a nice agreement with uh, the Stellar Development Foundation. This was just made public a couple weeks ago where, you know, they're, they are now helping to support Keybase as well. So for the foreseeable future, you know, Keybase will continue to exist. Your files are safe in Keybase. They're not just going to disappear and that sort, of, that sort of thing because Keybase goes out of business or anything like that. But I think, right, like I said, to summarize, we're thinking more about, you know, growth, getting people using the platform, and then we'll worry about, we'll worry about, there, 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 there'll be ways we can figure it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question that's uh, tangential to what Sean just asked. So with Bitcoin private key management today, you've got kind of two polar 
options. One is you manage your private key yourself. And if you lose it, then you lose all your Bitcoin associated with that. The other polar end is you have Coinbase manage your private key. Could Keybase be something that is in between those two options along that gradient? That's a great question. Yes. I think over the course of the coming months, uh, we're going to start to see that. I mean, I think that's something that we're going to be working on, not with Bitcoin, but with uh, likely with Stellar. So Stellar, for people who don't know, is, is a payment network that has a cryptocurrency associated with it called Lumens. It's a lot like Ripple, if people have heard of that. And, that. and that's what we're hoping for. I think one of the nice things that Keybase can bring, one of the nice advantages that Keybase can bring there is that you know, if we, if we do it right, we'll be able to allow, you know, your Stellar wallet will kind of follow you around from all your devices. So you'll be able to, for instance, be able to send payments from your phone or from your laptop. And the key, like the dissemination of that, of whatever your Stellar private key is, uh, will, will happen with Keybase will do it. So you don't have to worry about transferring it yourself, similar to just how you don't have to worry about transferring any of the other keys associated with your, with your Keybase account. So yes, we're hoping that, you know, we're hoping that Keybase will really kind of make it possible that you can have like convenient cryptocurrency payments without having to have your private key on a third party like Coinbase and without having to carry a hardware wallet around wherever you go. Testing. So my question is, what does the playing field for, for this type of product look like as far as other competitors that are doing a similar thing or could in the future try to attempt to do a similar thing and what other types of things could they do to compete and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any real direct competitor to this particular idea. Certainly there's competitors in like the various part, like the various apps that we're actually working with here, particularly chat. I mean, there's a lot of encrypted chat applications, many of which are more unpopular than than Keybase, uh, like (laughs) Signal, for instance. You know, I think a lot of what we're competing against is the existing applications in this space as well you know, things like Dropbox and and Slack and those sorts of things. We want to be able to convince people that, you know, using our application has real value, you know, that, you know, this, these crypto tools, I mean, this is becoming more easier by the day as like, you know, more and more privacy related problems come out in the world. You know, people are more and more looking for this kind of solution. I think, you know, in terms of other ideas to the identity problem, there's been a variety of ideas tossed around about blockchain solutions to the problem. So, you know, like, can you build something on top of Ethereum, for instance, that, you know, some smart contract that somehow encodes people's identities in a similar way that Keybase does? I think a lot of those kind of ideas run into to usability problems. You know, like any decentralized application always comes up against performance problems, comes up against, you know, just bugs that are very difficult to find, very difficult to fix because you have to disseminate your software to everybody that's running this thing. You know, it takes Bitcoin, like, sometimes years to get changes to their core software out into the wild fully deployed just because, you know, they need everybody on it. So I think, you know, for us, a lot of it is just kind of carving out what we think is kind of a new space here where we have these crypto applications that, you know, are good, you know, that, that are easy to use, that are hopefully somewhat easy to understand and that people want to use and, um, and go from there. And then, you know, hopefully that they provide a compelling sort of value add over things like Signal and, and more specialized apps just because of all the things they provide and this identity model, which we think is pretty novel. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. How does, how does account recovery work? How does account recovery work? That's a great question. It's actually, we spend probably about 40% of our time <laughs> working on making that easy. Basically, the way it works is there's an option on the site where you can so-called reset your account. You're only supposed to do that if you lose access to all the devices that are associated with your account. So for some reason, you know, you lost your phone, your computer, and whatever else, and you're out, then, then you need to reset. Now, a big bummer of having to reset is, is that you lose all of the information that's associated with, with your account. So if you had data in KBFS or if you had chats, they're gone. Like as soon as you reset, you're effectively like a new person. Typically, the way we do the reset is, you know, you can, if you still control the email account associated, we'll we'll send you a new password, you can reset and start over again. Or if you've completely lost it, then you come to us and we we go through some customer support kind of thing to make sure you are who you say you are kind of deal. The stakes are definitely higher for losing, for for losing these devices as opposed to something on Dropbox, where they can probably get you your data back or Slack, where you can probably get back in to your team. With Keybase, you know, it's very important for us that you not get back into your team because if you've lost all your devices, you're really no longer you as far as we're concerned. 
do you have any thoughts on like tattoo based paper key recovery? Yeah, well, <laughs> not any specific thoughts, but I mean, that is a good point. I didn't really mention paper keys too much, but there, there is like, you can create like a, um, a paper key, which is effectively just a giant pass, you know, giant pass, like a BIP20 pass phrase kind of thing that you can use to recover your account. If you lose that too, though, you're, you're again out of luck. That's why I figured like a QR code in a not visible place. Yeah. yeah, if you show up to the office, maybe that would work. No. Yeah. Okay. Hey, so I, I guess this is kind of related to some of the, the uh, wallet stuff you guys were talking Speak about. a little closer. Sorry, the wallet stuff you were talking about before. Oh, this is, this is crazy. But I, I'm wondering, you, you, you were talking about uh, sharing, I mean, Git or, or sharing, uh, having KBFS to, to share with specific people or as part of a team. And I'm wondering if there are any plans to have specifically sharing, uh, sharing of, of secrets. You mentioned the AWS access keys uh, in the Git context and how that kind of violates your, <laughs> your impulse. Like you wouldn't want to put that stuff in Git. You don't want to make any specific security records. Right, right. Yeah, we, we don't want to touch that. <laughs> but I'm wondering if, if I had like an API token that I needed to share with my team or some, uh, some personal account information that I was sharing with, with family. Are there, are there any plans to have that sort of I mean, you could do it with Git or KBFS, but it seems like something like, I guess, a, a key-based version of Vault or LastPass or one password or something, I guess is what I'm asking. Is anything like that planned or just use well, those products? I mean, I think that my best answer to that would be like, you should just use KBFS, I guess, um, or chat. You know, I think, you know, one thing you can do is, you know, you can have, you know, if you feel comfortable, you could put this in chat or depending on how long you want to get out. I mean, if you're talking about something that like should last for a long time, I would say, you know, KBFS is probably gonna be your best option. The good thing about KBFS is like I said, it's available on all your devices. Currently, it doesn't really work on mobile right now. In fact, it doesn't work at all. You can view like what folders you're in, but very shortly, I mean, we have this thing, I mean, in our prototypes, we're running it right now, where you can get at KBFS, all your KBFS files on your phone as well. So all this stuff should follow you around. I think, you know, more specific like UIs, like things like LastPass or like, you know, people, people always ask us, it's like, why doesn't Keybase have a password manager? You know, for instance, you know, it seems like a natural fit. And one of the reasons is because like a lot of the challenge with those kinds of apps are actually like UI challenge. Like why is one password so popular compared to the others? It's because it's got a great UI. You know, it works really well. People know how to use it. You know, so for us, like if we wanted to do something like that, we, we'd have to become experts on how to really make it like a good UI like that. So we're kind of hoping, you know, Keybase is very, it's built with third-party integrations in mind. We're kind of hoping that, you know, if Keybase gets to the point where it gets very popular, that people will start building tools maybe like that on top of it. You know, so if you had a particular use case that just wasn't really fully covered by KBFS or Git or wasn't covered in a way that you really liked, like a password manager or like a note system, it sounds like maybe that might be what you want, that somebody could maybe build one. And, you know, I think that that would be sort of the dream of Keybase. You know, that's how I think we would know that we'd really caught on if somebody actually did do something like that and whatever they built became popular. All right, Michael Maxim, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a break until 8 p.m. and you can get some more pizza, get a drink, go to the bathroom, all those requisite things, and then we'll be back at 8 p.m. These scratchers we put out on your seats, they do have those free passes to Dash. All right. So this is Habib Talavati from Clarify, and I have had the CEO of Clarify on the show before, and it was an incredible show. And Clarify is a basically a machine learning computer vision API, I think, if that's a good explanation for it. And one of the things that we discussed on this episode, the episode we did was a, was an overview of Clarify. So it was an overview of this machine learning computer vision company. And one of the things that he discussed was the process of training and deploying machine learning models. And the the deployment cycle and the retraining of machine learning models is is pretty underdeveloped area of software engineering, I think. And so I, I was really happy to have Habib be willing to to come to the to the meetup and I'm pretty sure that's what he's going to be discussing. So thank you very much for having me here for this meetup meeting and thanks Datadog for hosting the event. I'm Habib Talibati and I'm a technical lead at Clarify. I am uh, in charge of a product called Visual Search and also another product called Custom Training. But today I'm going to try to actually talk a little bit about everything including infrastructure. So let's see how well that goes. So I guess that's the agenda for today. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about what our company does, and then I'm going to talk about the stack for the deal ratio. About the clar clarify, you know, our history is that we started at 2013, you know, after our CEO actually, which she was a PhD student at the time, won ImageNet, you know, contest, uh, which is actually a pretty important contest in image classification. And then he founded the company at that time based on the research that he was doing at the time. Since then, we actually have grown a lot. We have built a lot of things. So for now, we have a variety of products that we have. We have machine learning as a service, as an API. We also have machine learning solutions. And uh, we do a variety of services that I'm going to probably touch on two of them, you know, in the next slides. And I guess that's the list of our investors. I guess one disclaimer here, I'm going to talk about GPUs a little bit. And GPUs are actually machine learning board are kind of tied to NVIDIA. And NVIDIA happened to be one of our investors, but that's all kind of coincidental. I'm not speaking for NVIDIA or anything. So what do we do? Part A, models. So we actually kind of build these pre-built models based on convolutional neural networks that you could actually use from our API to actually classify within different domains. We have a general one, we have food, you know, moderation, NSFW, all kinds of stuff. And most of them are based on this idea of you know, convolutional neural networks or deep learning. I guess you probably have heard that there is like a lot of you know, recent advancement in that area and we're trying to actually bank on that. So if you go to our website, you might actually find something called Model Gallery, which is like a bunch of models that are available. We have all kinds of stuff there. Like, for example, one is celebrity, the other one is like, you know, demographic, all kinds of stuff. General model, you know, getting embeddings and all that. But I'm going to talk about one of them, I'd just like to give you an idea how well these things actually work in certain cases. So we have an NSFW model that actually is pretty good. And why I claim that it's pretty good? Because that's, I guess, the performance curve of this model. So if you guys are familiar with this kind of, you know, graphs, that's exactly how you want your model to be, you know? Not having much, you know, true negatives while you have very good true positive, which means that you have extremely good, you know, precision and recall. And this is an example of the kind of you know, models that we actually provide. A lot of customers actually use this for moderation purposes. So, for example, they want to detect you know, that if they have some user posted NSFW you know, kind of content on their website, they can actually detect using this model. And like, I, I want to show you some examples of how well this thing actually works. So look at this one. I have legs. So this thing is predicted as safe for work. The probability is actually pretty convincing. Also, you can see the other one, the general model that we have, and it's actually predicting a bunch of tags. And you can see it's actually pretty good. It's bathroom, bathtub, bath, shower, you know, wash, all kinds of stuff. So this variety of tags that general, our general model actually produces is very useful. And you can actually use it for other applications, including search. And here is a bunch of other examples. So this one also was predicted as 0.97 safe for work, which is what you want. Another one, 0.99. No boy. 0.99 safe for work. 0.99 safe for work. Yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah. So this is an example of the kind of model that that we build and we make available to our customers. Or actually two examples because you see the general model as well. But. Let's actually move on to the second thing. Actually, one thing that I personally am pretty much involved, I'm actually in charge of this particular product, which is search. So it's to organize your data. You know, a lot of people actually, what we realize is after they use our models to actually tag their data, they also almost all the time do some kind of search on top of it. So we figured that maybe we should do the search to help these guys, you know. And we went ahead and do it, did it. And we can do all kinds of, you know, searches, you know, search by tag. So it will look like something like this. Basically, you can search by, okay, I added all my data. I want all the dogs. Here, there you go. You can do something like a reverse image search. Basically, you search by an image, and we find the images that are similar to it. And we even can combine different kinds of searches. So I can say dog 
and that image, and then it finds these kind of things for you. So the dogs that are wearing, you know, red shoes. So it works decently okay. So this is the second product that I wanted to kind of give you an example of the stuff that we do. But let's move on to the second part of the talk, which is basically our stack. Although I, I have to mention that actually we do a lot more than this. Like we do all kinds of models, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. Just wanted to give you a taste. So our stack, I guess I'm going to dive into it. I'm going to show you a diagram. So that's what we do. So we have an API and uh, this is actually the API that we have on our production setup. So most machine learning companies actually have, usually, usually have a production setup and an experimentation setup, which I'm going to talk about more. And this is basically our production setup for the API. And I'm actually kind of simplified this to the almost non-existence. So I'm just keeping the most bigger pieces. Yeah, what's up? So, so the search, right? So you would be searching within your database, right? So fiber to use. Your API. <clears throat> Can I upload my data and search? Yeah, yeah. So the API supports indexing. So basically, that is your data. Actually, what I showed you is you okay, so actually. I, I upload the data. Yeah, it goes to our servers. It gets indexed. It becomes available for search, like any other search services. So that's something that I have to. So basically, you can actually get that uh, on our servers, which are located on AWS right now, but. One thing I, I uh, want to mention is actually one of the challenges for us right now is trying to actually decouple ourselves from the cloud platform. So we want to actually not be tied to any specific cloud platform because a lot of customers want a specific cloud platform or don't want a specific cloud platform. Uh, so wouldn't it be like easier if you push the code towards the database? Yeah, and then you, it enables you to actually support on-prem solutions as well which is another set of you know, solutions, which is also pretty important. But basically, I want to talk a little bit about this guy. So in the production setup, you have this API layer that basically is behind a load balancer, all the usual stuff, encryption, all that. You can index you know, your assets, and they are going to be actually run through a bunch of machine learning models. And once they are run through those machine learning models, the result is going to be written to the database. So machine learning models can produce tags similar to the stuff that I just showed you, but they also can produce something called embedding, which is a representation of whatever concept that you are trying to do according to that model. And those things you can actually kind of store and search against. And that's, that's what we are doing. Also, there is a read pass, which is like, you know, doing the search query. And basically, that guy comes also the database, but it actually is not a simple lookup. What you actually you do usually in these kind of cases is you actually try to do the search smartly by clustering your data and doing a two-stage process. So basically, when you do the search, you first actually match and find the relevant cluster of the data. You fetch candidates from there, and then you do a second you know, search on the candidates. So it's a multi-stage process, and you probably don't want to just brute force it because it doesn't work at all if you do that. It won't scale. So that's the gist of it. Now for the database part, since this is an uh, infrastructure talk, we actually use Citus MX, which has historical reasons, plus also I kind of is something technology that's useful in our case. So the original version of this uh, system was written using RDS basically Postgres, single node, whatever. And at some point we wanted to scale it. And I personally didn't want to rewrite everything on a different technology. So I decided to just like scale it using something that looks like a Postgres. And Citus is actually a shard of Postgres essentially. It has a lot of nice properties. For example, it has a ring architecture, which means that everyone can be master, which means that when you do a query, you're going to actually hit any of the nodes as the coordinator or master of your query. And that means that your read and write throughput is actually multiplied by the number of nodes that you have in your machine compared to RDS, which is extremely useful if you are trying to build a high throughput system. Also, it actually helps us to 
serve the search queries pretty fast because it actually parallelizes the result like any you know, sharded system. So we can actually search multiple shards in parallel. And that's why we use it. And it also has nice transactional properties, which in this kind of system is actually useful. Because this also, in addition to search, does other stuff, and we want to have certain transactional properties. For example, SideSMS recently implemented distributed transactions, which I guess, if you guys have heard, is pretty difficult to implement. And there are maybe only a spanner and you know, CockroachDB uh, who actually successfully implemented that. And SideSMX has it, which is very good for us. Yeah, I guess the noteworthy stuff, I mentioned a bunch of them. I guess we use Go in most of the non-scientific computing part. For the scientific computing part, we just use Python, like any other ML shop. We use GPUs at inference time in this stack. We also use GPUs at the training time, which is not shown here, but that's a different story. And basically, Cytos help us actually to kind of scale our rights. So that's another thing. And the most important thing, which is like the last part of the talk, is actually we are using Kubernetes to actually manage all the containerized application services in the previous slide. So everything, you know, you, you can see that there is a section application services and there is a section data services. So everything on the application services is dockerized and managed by Kubernetes. API layer, ML stack, you know, indexing. Data services are outside of the Kubernetes and they are like, you know, either on AWS, it can be a cache, it can be Citus, which we use managed Citus. Basically, at being a startup, we don't want to actually manage our own databases. Uh, they are outside Kubernetes. But inside Kubernetes, the ML stack uses GPUs, and we want to actually kind of talk about that a little bit more. Oh, before that, actually, one of the things that this stack has is actually monitoring. We extensively use Datadog. And I think I've, I've heard that, that actually we were one of the first users of the, you know, Datadog for Kubernetes. So apparently we started at a time that they were ironing bugs and like it was before my time, but like, you know, uh, apparently there were those, those days were interesting. So, but we are using it and we are pretty happy with it. So this is an example of a dashboard that we have. But, okay, so now the last part of the talk, which is the GPUs, which is most more infrastructure. So show of hands. How many of you guys actually have used GPUs in production? Okay, so good. So I guess I can talk a little bit more about the details. So basically, when you are using GPUs for machine learning in production, usually you, you have two kinds of you know, uh, use cases. One is actually some kind of batch training or some kind of batch processing, which is usually for training. Then there is a real-time online use cases that usually happens at inference time. Basically, when you are trying to use the models that you just trained. So we actually use GPUs for both use cases, but I'm going to focus on the second one. Very recently, we actually managed to use Kubernetes for handling the first use case, which means that we actually, our experimental setup also runs on Kubernetes if we want to. And we can actually scale our you know, infrastructure for training to hundreds of nodes and then scale it down on notice if we want to actually do a quick experiment you know, very extensively. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm just talking about using the GPUs at inference time in that stack that I just showed you, right? Which is basically what I said, you know, then clarify workloads are either for training neural networks or prediction and inference. And basically we run Kubernetes on AWS, which is what we do. Now everything is nice, but I want to actually kind of talk a little bit about how we actually end up using the, the Kubernetes. So I, we are going back maybe to 2015, November or something. At that time, our company, you know, we're running on virtual machines. Deployment means, means that actually you have to kind of build these virtual machines, you know, build a new set, move the traffic to this new set of, you know, the virtual machines and kind of destroy the old one. So if you did a small code change, it would mean that you need to spend several hours just actually just working on this thing and banging your head on the keyboard. So that was the old system. And it was very difficult to work with. Then our team, infrastructure team actually came in and they decided to use Kubernetes. So by the way, disclaimer, so I'm 
like I said, I'm not a member of the uh, uh, infrastructure team, so I'm actually basically presenting their work. So this is not um, my personal work. So they said, we want Kubernetes, we want containers, we want discovery, we don't want VMs. And this is, remember, this is November 2015. I guess in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they're not. So in practice, they run into problems. Kubernetes at the time had a lot of you know, useful features, but it actually lacked, oh, snap, no GPU support, no SSL support, no SSL support with ELB, no ECR support. Easy to get your whole AWS account throttled. That one is actually kind of interesting. So basically, uh, the way Kubernetes works, it actually kind of, to, uh, kind of asks AWS or what nodes are up and you know, what's going on and a bunch of metadata and all that. So at the time, you just could easily get yourself in you know, because of a series of bugs on your entire account because you made too many of these requests. And then, you know, I don't know, you were developing something on your test, you know, test cluster, suddenly your entire AWS becomes throttled. And it was actually extremely painful also to uh, debug as well because what's going on. So our company at the time, we ended up actually submitting changes to open source you know, Kubernetes at the time to address all of these issues. So we added the support for GPUs, some form of experimental version of it. We added, you know, SSL support for ELB, ECR support, and also worked with uh, AWS to make sure that that thing doesn't happen, you know, throttling, and make sure that, you know, that metadata is actually cached on the Kubernetes side, so basically nothing bad happens. And I'm, I'm going to actually more go, I'm going to skip the last three, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about the GPU part of it. So the GPU part of it, November 2015, how do you get GPU support? You find export engineers, I guess you guys probably know Borg, which is a product that equivalent to Kubernetes that actually Google uses internally. And it had support for GPUs for years. So you find these guys as GPU support in Kubernetes, and then you profit. But there were issues, realities, stuff like that. We had long discussions about how to do it. Essentially, at some point, but the problem is like in these kind of projects, if you actually kind of add something, you know, willy-nilly, you might, it might actually break, you know, future releases and something bad happens. And, you know, like it's hard to predict that, you know, how things evolve. So really want to actually kind of get it right and just not randomly add the stuff. So essentially at some point they kind of come up with a very pared down basic version. It will become available at July, 2016. It was nice, but it had limitations, actually lots of them. So you could have any cars that you want as long as it's by NVIDIA. Actually, the way you actually kind of make this thing work, this flag that I just put here, experimental NVIDIA GPU, you have to actually add this to your kubelet run command. Basically, that's how you get it. It only supported one device per node. You couldn't tell that what kind of GPU you are using. Is it an ancient one or is it something new or how much of the RAM of this thing it was using? No resource usage reporting, nothing. And data log, no data log for that matter. So. But we still did it. Also, even more revision, this, this one is actually pretty awful. So this thing, actually for it to work, it needs actually certain kernel driver, you know, libraries on the node itself. You cannot package, you know, your libraries into your uh, container and ship it with it. It, will, it won't work. So you actually have to make sure the correct libraries are actually put in the node, which is really painful. And if you don't, it will crash with the most awful error or like un unhelpful error that you've seen. And you cannot figure out what, what's going on. You have to deal with that. So it means that you have to, when you, when you were actually kind of managing your nodes, you have to make sure that you have the correct libraries, which usually people don't do in Kubernetes work. But yeah, we were doing it. But yeah, we did it and it was useful for us. Why? Because that three hours that I talked about, that would take us, you know, to actually deploy a code, after this was pared down to five minutes. And we could actually scale up and down by just clicking the dashboard, which is like, was great for us. So in that stack, those ML machines, ML models that I showed you, we could just scale up and down those things, you know, on demand at moment notice, you know, recently we actually added auto scaling. So you can actually kind of auto scale automatically based on, you know, traffic and stuff like that, which is pretty nice. Now, we added this, all these things you know, around 2016, but 
these days things are much easier. You don't have to deal with a lot of these issues. So for example, recent developments, there is this concept of device or hardware plugins that Kubernetes introduced, which essentially abstract away the problem of actually where the system libraries are or any other problem related to the device for you. Like for example, what kind of NVIDIA card have, how many of those things have, the stuff like that. So instead of actually somehow hard coding this somewhere, you actually kind of just ask this device plugin that how many of those guys, how many GPU you have, how many whatever you have. You get, you know, the libraries, passes and everything, which is nice because it means that whatever system that you design will be portable across different, you know, clusters. Multi-GPU support added, which means that you can actually use more than one GPU in each pod, which is a great and actually be needed because a lot of our models don't fit in one GPU. Also, there is this daemon set that actually helps, you know, uh, installation, with the installation of, you know, these drivers, so we don't have to do all those manual awful things that we used to do. And actually, we use these, all these things in our experimental setup that I mentioned, that uh, we can kind of scale to hundreds of machine nodes if you wanted to, and we use these guys. So still, I just mentioned what works for us, why do it? Oh yeah, and I guess there is all, also, the battle is not won. There's a lot more to be done. For example, we need better scheduling. Some kind of advanced scheduling that basically knows and averages of, you know, what kind of card you have, what's the limitation, stuff like that, and kind of schedule based on that. Like, for example, something like Affinity is very important in this world. Like, if you have a node with four, you know, GPU cards, talking, for example, from card zero, uh, between the communication between card zero and one might be actually faster because of the affinity issues versus, you know, zero and three. So you really want to actually get zero and one when you ask for two. You don't want to get zero and three. And that's an issue that has been around in Kubernetes. I think it's not limited to GPUs, CPUs also, but we want this kind of, you know, smart scheduling, which is something that is useful for us. Another thing that we really want to see in Kubernetes is actually device sharing or over committing, which by the way, we actually do right now. So there is a hack or trick that you can kind of do that you can actually get this. But I think with the newer version of Kubernetes, our hack will break and we want like actual official sharing and stuff like that. And the hack is actually quite interesting. Like remember that I showed you that, you know, like flag that you can say I want NVIDIA GPUs equal one. Actually, nothing stops you from saying I want 100 GPUs on a machine that has only one GPU. So what it does is basically creates 100, you know, like objects and it maps it to one GPU. So now if one application comes in and says I want 20, it's going to give you 20% of that 100. And it's basically some form of sharing, which is pretty useful because a lot of models actually don't use the entire GPU, and you can actually kind of run a bunch of the smaller things you know, next to them. So you end up actually using a lot less GPU in your, in your machine, in your cluster with this thing. But the problem is like, there is no enforcement. So if some process that you're running decides to suddenly do something nasty, nothing stops them from actually hugging all the memory on the GPU and kind of causing huge problems for everything else that is actually being run there. So you have to, you can only really run, do these kind of things in an environment that you actually trust other processes, which is actually the case for us because we can actually predict how much memory each one of our models actually need because they usually allocate at the very beginning and that's it. And then they're just like flat and still, yeah. Yeah, so that's like a story of the adding GPUs. These days people actually, I guess very recently, Kubeflow is added, it's a lot easier. But I guess we were the very first company that actually started using this. And uh, we look forward to actually even use it even more. And it's an integral part of our business. All right. Habib Talabati. Questions? How do you manage Kubernetes in AWS? Do you do it yourselves or do you use? What we use ECR. Doing? So that's why we added the support for ECR, basically. What did you say? E? Yeah. Elastic container or something. Like that would be us. Yeah. Is it still? The registry, yeah. 
No, I mean Kubernetes itself. So for example, the Kubernetes worker, do you guys install and provision the Kubernetes workers yourselves? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actually provision the machines ourselves, yeah, manually. Cool. Do you provision bare metal servers for the GPUs to run efficiently or how does do you provision VMs? You can do both actually. So there are cases that you want to do VMs. For example, if you have an experimental setup, like you can actually give the entire experimental setup to the, to the Kubernetes and then no one can touch anything. But some researchers or AML uh, machine learning engineers will be kind of not, not very happy that they don't have direct access to the GPUs. So one thing you could do is you could actually run two VMs and give half of the GPUs and the resources and everything to one of the you know, uh, VMs and give another half to everyone and then run Kubernetes on the second VM while if the first VM is actually kind of wild best, everyone can go for it, you know, stuff like that. So one more unrelated question. How do you do the feedback loop of like, once you classify an image, how do you know whether it's right or wrong? Like, how, yeah. how do you get that feedback loop and sort of- Yeah, so we, we have, uh, our API actually ha has a full evaluation suite, which you can actually kind of run on the models that you customize yourself. So one thing that it supports that I didn't mention or gloss over, you could actually build your own custom models and you can evaluate those. So that's one part of this, evaluating those. The models that are pre-built and you cannot customize, like the general model and SFW, we actually pretty much do a lot of exp experimentations and evaluations before we ship them. So like all the normal stuff that everyone does, you know, having test sets, like, you know, looking at the different metrics that you want to actually have in a multi-label you know, classification. Actually, I showed one of you the curve you know, of true positive versus you know, true negatives. You look at all those metrics and only when those things are actually good enough across the board, we actually kind of ship those previous models. And interestingly, actually the code that we use to evaluate those previous models is kind of the same as the code that is actually in the API is exposed to the users. So they work on the same principles on everything. What's your container format? So we use Docker, basically. It's probably... Any other questions? All right. I think we're good. Thanks, Habib. Thank you. And so now we'll hang out for another 15, 20 minutes and, you know, chat or take off, whatever you like. But, uh, yeah, I want to thank the, the speakers, Mike and Habib, and thank Datadog, of course, for hosting this awesome meetup. And all of you for showing up because this was an awesome community. Really great conversations. So thank you all. Wow.